So today is the last lecture. The next lecture is canceled. Uh, if you have any questions, or uh, if you want me to go over anything, you can, you're welcome to set up an appointment for next Wednesday or before then. And you can come to my office if you have any questions about any of the materials that we covered so far. So instead of uh, me coming on, uh, coming here and, and just repeating what I said already. Um, what I'm going to do is, if you have any questions, if there's a certain concept, especially in plasticity or anything that you don't understand in the previous assignment or in any of the previous assignments, just set up an appointment and I can sit with you and explain what we uh, did. So, there is, uh, in your notes, there is a problem that you should not try, which is problem number nine. not attempt problem number 9 because it's based on some information that I did not provide. Problem number 9 in these numbers. So let's uh, remember what we did. So in plasticity what we said is from the stress versus plastic screen, we predict the following. As if I plot sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, if I look at a three-dimensional space made out of the three stress, principal stress components, the yield stress in any direction is given by this value. So this is in 3D, so from the material will yield once sigma 1 reaches this value, which is sigma yield, or when sigma 2 reaches this value, or when sigma 3 reaches this value and so you get this cylinder which is what we call a Malmesis cylinder or the yield surface if you look at it in It's 
cylinder in the space. Any point inside means that the material has not yielded. The material will only yield once I hit, once the stress state is on that surface. So what happens when the stress increases? If it's possible that the stress increases. It's only possible that the stress increases if the material can harden. And yes, the material can harden because the yield stress increases as I put more yield, more plastic strain. So as you put more plastic strain, you can see that the yield stress increases. And so, since the material, this material is of course is history dependent, after when you apply this particular plastic strain, then the yield stress, this is sigma yield one, this is sigma yield two, then this one Mises cylinder increases in size. So the yield stress, if I pull in direction 1, will be this much, from 0 to here. In the second direction, from will also be higher. Isotropic hardening. Hardening happens in all the directions. If I, if I, uh, let's explain this in a. The hardening happens. So this is a cylinder. Sorry for my uh, uh, drawing skills. And the cylinder in the stress space you can see is becoming bigger, which means that more the elasticity region is bigger. When we say isotropic hardening, it means the fault. Let's look. Let's take this piece of metal. And first, let's stretch it in the direction of E1. Then you'll get this response, let's see. say this is three hundred and let's say this is five hundred where this is sigma on one that's normal this is the true stress first is true string I just took that piece of metal and extended it and after extending I Uh, unloaded. And let's say if somebody else came later, doesn't know what the history of this material is. They just found it, and they're just going to do the same thing. Then they're going to load it in sigma on one, epsilon on one. What will they find? They will find this. This is five. They will find this, they will track, they will follow this portion of the group. If another person comes, so this is total this is total strain. Yes. If somebody doesn't know the history. Somebody doesn't know the history. I don't. If you look at a piece of metal, you don't know if it's developed plastic stream or not. It's, it doesn't write. It's not written on it because it, yeah, you, you don't know. You found this piece, 
and you loaded it, and you say, well, the yield stress is 500. I mean, the apparent yield stress is 500. Now, maybe in its history, the yield stress at some point was 300. If you know the history, you know that you're here. But if you don't know the history, you're starting from zero. So this is not knowing the history. And again, not knowing the history If you pull in the second direction this we expect, or the, the, this model that we're using, the isotropic carbon model won't predict this as well, 500 will predict the same response This. So if, I, if there's no Boschinger effect, not only this, if I put, if I don't know the history and I take that specimen, and, uh, and I apply compression, and I make sure that as I'm applying the compression, I'm not uh, buckling the specimen. And I will also get a response that looks like this. And this is negative 500. And so this is what an, an isotropic carbon, if, if, the, if the material follows the isotropic carbon model, this is what you will see. But in, in, in uh, uh, there are different now metal alloys that don't don't follow this, and what happens is the following. I'll give you a very perfect example. Is pipeline steeds. So what happens in pipeline steeds? Get a plate. and it's welded right here. So this is, first it's made into a U. This is the U process, this is the O process, and after making it into an O and welding it, then it's expanded. 2% plastic strain, let's say. This is arbitrary, but let's say 2% plastic strain. Every bell will, will decide on what plastic strain they will create. And so this is the original pipe. And then after expansion, now they applied some plastic strain. And now it looks like this. So this is original. This is expanded. So, I'm going to pick a specimen right here. One. So 
this is the specimen. E1 is longitudinal in direction. And E2 is the circumferential direction. Now, if this is uh, the material that follows the isotropic carbonyl model, the history is the history will not make this, the, the the behavior in any of the direction different. The behavior in any of these two directions will be the same. It's just function. Yes, it's function of the history, but the behavior, whether I pull in E1 or E2, should be the same. But what happens is that one of the directions, because this follows, the, these metals, usually the high strength alloys, have pushing their effects, you will find the behavior to, to have the following, you find the following behavior. If this is the stress versus the strain, one direction look like this, and the other direction will look like this. So now, given the information that we talked about, if I call this C, and this is L, this is 1, and this is 2. One, two, sigma L, sigma C. Which is which? What's that? One is sigma L. If Fatima says one is sigma L, who agrees? Graham says one is sigma C. <laughs> so if one is sigma L and two is sigma C, and you agree with one. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> so Graham? No. They so the length doesn't change when they expand it based on the picture you drew at the top. If they expand it, the cross section gets bigger. Yes. So that should put in residual plastic strain in that direction. Yes. Which one is that direction? One or two? Should be one. No, that's two. Uh, that, I mean, sorry, this is C. Uh, oh, yeah, okay, I got you. It's C. So what happens is as you, because you could. So let's look at what happens if I plot Sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, where sigma 1 is the longitudinal stress, sigma 2 is the circumferential stress. So let's see. Initially, we can assume that both had the same side. So if I go into this direction, I'm going to yield the same as if I go in this direction. But the history, what happened with the history is that we pushed this point all the way up to here. The history, when we expanded the pipe, we pu pushed this point here. The circumferential stress, the yield stress now is higher. And the yield stress in the longitudinal direction actually decreased. And in compression, also decreased. And so you get a yield surface that actually looks like this. You 
again, this is a, a, a circle. What happens is the model that we can use assumes that that cylinder keeps, it stays a cylinder. Now, it, other models can predict that it's not a cylinder anymore. But the, the, the next uh, simple model, after just assuming that I have a cylinder that increases in size, is to assume that the cylinder just moves. It's uh, so that it, it shifts towards one direction or the other direction according to the stress. Now, this is just a slight uh, addition or a slight com uh, making just adding a slight complexity to the previous model without adding too much complexity. Because adding too much complexity, I could assume that the yield surface would have a, a much more involved. I could assume the yield surface to have whatever form I want. But, but a, a simple assumption is to just say, okay, well, I've increased the yield here, then I decrease it in compression, and I decrease it in tension. And it turns out that this assumption predicts, uh, is very, uh, has very good agreement with the experiments. Now, of course, the material does not know anything about it. A cylinder does not know anything about any of these mathematical uh, models. It just, we assume a mathematical model and it happens to fit most of the experiments or have a good fit with the experiments. So just, let's, uh, I'm just going to add what happens in tension and compression. say sigma 1 versus epsilon 1. This is the initial response. Let's say you decide to unload here. So you unload and you leave your, 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 your that piece and you go away. Somebody else finds it and decides to load it both in tension and in compression. So they don't know the history, so this could be their starting point. They don't know the history, they're going to find that sigma on 1 has this uh, behavior, and they're going to find the compression has this behavior. The yield in compression is much smaller. And the center of the yield surface, or the center of that cylinder, lies somewhere here halfway in between those two and so what we would be looking for in such a model there are two things the yield stress and also the location of that center where is that center because that center will probably change. And so what we end up with, or what we're looking for, is if this is sigma yield, and this is epsilon p, this is the yield stress with epsilon p, and this is the location of the center. This is what we call off, or back stress. Whoever developed this theory called this back stress. The center called it back stress. In a yield, in, a, in an isotropic environment, the back stress is here. Back stress is here. This value is called sigma yield alpha, which is the size or the defines the size of the yield surface. And this value is alpha defines 
the location of the center of the non mesent center. And this whole thing finds the yield strips in a uniaxial direction. So the yield stress that you see, if you take the specimen and you pull it in one direction, the yield stress that you see is composed of two things. One is the size of the yield surface, and the other one is just how far the, the center of the yield surface has moved in that direction. So there are different models for that account for this anisotropic part. The first model looks at this, or tries to model this behavior. Simplified model. Sorry, linear kinematic hardening with a constant size of the yield surface. This is sigma on one, this is epsilon on one. When I look at it in the, in the space of sigma on one versus of sigma 1 versus sigma 2 versus sigma 3. Then what happens is, if I load in this direction, I just move this yield surface in this direction. It keeps the same size. Then, let's say I unload again, and then start loading in sigma 2, then the yield stress now is, is lower in sigma 2, and then I can try, if I load more, then the yield surface moves in this direction, and so on. So the yield surface keeps its size, but just keeps traversing according to where you would push it. As you push, or as you, uh, the, the direction of the applied stress decides on the direction of the movement of the yield surface. Plot 
versus the same yield. And so this will be the initial yield. I'm not going to put plot any elastic strings, just the elastic strings. As well, this you'll have constant size of the yield surface. So when I unload and then unload again, this will be the behavior in the output here. Now there's a there is a story. Behind this Armstrong rendering law, which one of my uh, graduate students discovered, is that they made this model a long time ago and stopped doing research in this area. They were hired at some, by a consultant to do a. They were a consultant, they were hired to develop a model that would predict um, nonlinear kinematic parts. Because they, their available model was, was this linear kinematic hardening model with a constant size of, that had a constant size of the industry. So they were hired to develop something else. So they developed a, just added a small term to make this bounded and left the C. And didn't realize that their model is the most used model in the literature that this that uh, is used for uh, nonlinear kinematic art. And it, it, any software actually utilizes that model. And I think what happened is that somebody found the report and said, oh, this is a neat idea, and just took it forward, and then later tried to find those people. And and uh, the, I think I read a quote by the person who actually developed this, it's like, I didn't realize, never thought that this small report that we wrote would make it that big. So you never know. You never know what you can do in the research community. Maybe 50 years from now, the paper that you wrote, takes off. The different softwares also allow you to do the bulk. Different kind of them than other softwares, they give you this, which is alpha, This uses the Armstrong Frederick law, which we will talk about in a second. And you can have this is called a nonlinear isotropic, because this is the isotropic part, because that's the size of the yield surface. Defines the size of the yield surface. The isotropic part can be nonlinear and nonlinear kinematic part. So, this is just a, the, all this is the Basically, the, 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 a little bit of the background, the physics, and the, uh, or, or the, 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 what the observations are, and what the possible mathematical formulations are. And now let's go through the equations that are used to model something like this. Say this is T. That's, I'm going to call this U over gamma. I'm going to put over here C over gamma multiplied by 1 
minus a term that goes to zero when epsilon b p goes to infinity. So that when epsilon when when the because the vast extreme goes to infinity, I want this to be equal to this bounding term. And what's the best thing that I can put here? The one thing that they found that, or that, that they introduced is this. E power negative gamma epsilon. As this goes to infinity, this becomes 1 over E power infinity. 1 over E power infinity is 0. So we end up with this term bound. If this term is bound, okay, so now we have in a uniaxial case, what is this one? And if you have the stress strain curve, or you have data for this, alpha, all you have to do is just fit the data. This model to find C and L. There's two material constants. So in, 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 different references might use different uh, constants. They might not call them C and L. But it's just the same form. But we're also we're dealing with uh, rates here, so I'm going to take alpha dot, which is equal to the alpha. Alpha dot is equal to negative c over gamma e power negative alpha epsilon p multiplied by negative gamma epsilon p dot. So I can now replace A uniaxial state, in a uniaxial state, epsilon p is equal to epsilon p it, it is equal to the plastic strain in the direction one. state, I know where alpha is. So 
So what about in a multi-axial state? So in a multi-axial state, alpha is uh, called the back stress tensor and has nine components. because the yield surface will move in the stress space. So the, the center of that yield surface will have nine components according to the, the, the underlying space, which is the stress space. So the center is a vector, and that vector has nine components. So this is the, the, the evolution law for the back stress evolution law. So what about the yield surface itself? In general, the yield surface is a cylinder with a center at alpha, which is a vector, alpha here is a vector, and with a radius that's equal to root 2 over 3 sigma yield alpha. So the, the, the yield surface then becomes sigma one reasons evaluated at sigma minus alpha minus sigma yield alpha is equal to three. So this is the yield surface. Instead of the, the actual one reason stress that you use, which is you put uh, sigma 1, one, sigma 2, two, sigma 3, three. Instead of sigma 1, one, sigma 2, two, sigma 3, three, you put sigma on 1 minus alpha on 1. Sigma 2, two minus alpha 2, two. Sigma 3, three minus alpha 3. So, sigma 1 means evaluated that sigma minus alpha is equal to the bottom. Sigma on 1 minus alpha on 1. Sigma on 1 minus plus sigma 2, two. Square plus close to minus, I'm sorry. Minus sigma three three minus alpha three three squared plus and so on. Plus three sigma one two minus alpha one two squared. Plus sigma 2 1 minus alpha 2 1 squared. And these are the same, so you can use the 6, but I'll just left it like that. 
sigma one two and sigma two one are the same, and in, in your equation you have six or three multiplied by sigma one two squared plus sigma two one squared. Or you can look at it as false. Instead of, because we know that the equation for the Von Mises stress is basically 3 over 2 sigma j, sigma j. Instead of using sigma j, sigma j, you put sigma j minus alpha, but not the whole alpha, the deviatory part of the alpha. And these two equations are the same. So how does This model predict. This model predicts the following. If this is sigma u and this is epsilon p, we're always using this value is called c over gamma. center the center of the yield surface will be bounded by a cylinder with a radius root over 3 zero gamma. So the center of the yield surface will always be somewhere here. The radius of the circle, or the is always equal to root two over three sigma yield alpha. The yield surface will never be higher than the value will never be higher than root two over three sigma x. Because the stress can never increase over this sigma x. So let's revisit the main equations, or let's basically compare the equations that we developed last time and the equations that we developed here. Isotropic carbon. Surface. Sigma von Mises minus sigma yield is equal to zero. Here, sigma von Mises 
evaluated at sigma minus alpha, not evaluated at the stress itself, it's evaluated at sigma minus alpha, minus sigma d yield alpha, which is the size of the yield stress, the, the size of the center is equal to zero. sigma non Mises dot minus sigma yield alpha dot equals zero. This is partial sigma non Mises. By partial sigma ij, sigma dot ij minus or plus partial sigma non Mises. Partial alpha ij, alpha dot ij. Because sigma non Mises is function of the stresses and the back stress tensor components as well, minus partial sigma yield of by partial epsilon p, epsilon prime p dot equal to. What happens when I have a constant size of the yield surface? Which term goes to zero? surface has a constant size, this goes to zero. It goes to zero if the size of the yield surface is constant. It's not always constant, but just sometimes I make life easy by giving you this as the, the size, the constant, the, the size of the yield surface is constant. Which means, I'm just going to scroll up all the way to the initial, just assuming that this, this, that this distance is always constant. Sigma alpha is always constant. Science just moves. How would you find the inland that's here? Well, we'll see. So find epsilon p and so I use and now I need to find the plastic strains so that the what do, what do we call it the flow group epsilon plastic ij is equal to partial f by partial sigma ij epsilon so this is dot this is dot p and partial f by partial sigma ij is equal to 3 over 2 sij over sigma minus. So 
this is this concludes the this part. Correct? Here I'm still missing this this and alpha dot. Because I if I have a stress that's increasing, I can put how much the stress is increasing, but I don't know how alpha dot is changing. So I have to use the back stress evolution law. Which states that alpha dot ij is equal to c over sigma yield alpha multiplied by sigma ij minus alpha ij. minus cos alpha g so now I can instead of alpha dot ij I can put this equation only function of, of, uh, of this p and I can solve this equation to find the evolution of the plastic stream parameter after I find the evolution of the plastic stream parameter I can find the evolution of the back stress components and I can still use the flow rule, it still applies. Which now here partial f by partial sigma j, which will happen to be equal to negative partial f by partial alpha j. This is equal to <coughs> 3 over 2 Sij minus alpha Ij. Deviatoric, the deviatoric component is the same. Sij is the deviatoric component of the stress. Alpha Ij the, the, the deviatoric, is the deviatoric component of the back stress tensor divided by sigma mesa, evaluated at sigma minus one. And so, the only addition here is just we assume that instead of having the, the cylinder, or instead of skewing the von Mises cylinder, we said that this the von Mises cylinder, instead of making it more an ellipse, because we could have made it into an ellipse, instead of making it into an ellipse, we just made it into a cylinder that moves. And we define an evolution law where its center is. And that center, that evolution law is, uh, is governed by the Armstrong Frederick law that realized that this most of the experiments fit to this law. Now, if you look into a plasticity book, you might find an enormous number of evolution laws, the Ziegler's law, or many other laws that are introduced for the back stress evolution law. And the history, because to come up with this model, it was not, it was not just simply, oh, let's use this model and, and that's it. They, there were so many possibilities for this back stress evolution law. There's so many controversies too developing a model and realizing oh, it doesn't fit a certain type of experiment. So let's try to find another model that would fit a, a, another experiment and so on until this one which fits most of the experiments so far. And you'll always end up with this. Now if we're using uh, the linear model, So this is your regard. If you are, if you want to use this model, the main difference is this this term goes. No.
harder than God. And I'm just going to go to the uniaxial case. In the uniaxial case, Basically, if you it's not very clear, but basically the, the slope would be equal to C. So, yeah, it's not very clear, but, but if you just, uh, the, the linear model would make alpha dot ij as a function of epsilon, uh, p is just a linear function c, and so this would go uh, alpha would be equal to, or gamma equal zero for the linear kinematic hardening model. And in a linear kinematic hardening model as well, this is constant. just makes the equations probably a little bit easier to solve. So this is it for everything that I want to talk about for the term. I'm just going to go through an example. I'll give you five minutes and then I'm going to go through an example. And the example just follows the same steps that we did in the previous example. You just have the equations, you plug in the numbers, and you integrate. Alright?